Welcome, fellow true crime enthusiasts, to today's case file, Remembering Bill and Lorraine Courier, part five in our Israel Keys series. Welcome to Body of Crime, your go-to true crime podcast, where we plunge headfirst into the gripping world of criminal mysteries. Join your hosts, Jose Medina, Crystal Garcia, and Alicia Anaya, as we deliver the full stories immersing you in the heart of each case. With spine-chilling cases, in-depth analysis, captivating interviews, and a comprehensive examination of the evidence, embark on a thrilling journey with us as we explore bone-chilling cases from around the globe. Whether you're a seasoned true crime enthusiast or a fresh face in the genre, we guarantee to keep you on the edge of your seat. So put on your detective hat, grab your notepad, and get ready to dive into the thrilling world of body of crime. devastated by their disappearance and in fear for their lives. Bill and Lorraine Courier's family made another plea Friday for the public's help. Every day that they're not found increases our concern. So our families have come here today to offer a reward of up to $10,000. The reward comes as police say they've scoured surveillance video and records and searched a square mile around the couple's Essex home, including the area where their car was found abandoned a week ago. We have received dozens of leads from concerned citizens regarding possible sightings of the couriers. And police are still looking for this person of interest, possibly seen driving the couple's car after they disappear. She was very, very afraid. Linda Pratt, an old friend of Lorraine Courier, says they last saw each other two months ago. We just started laughing and talking about old times. When the two started catching up, Pratt says Courier told her she'd been bothered by a man lately. She never mentioned a name. She just said, this guy, at this point, I'm scared to death of him. It's like he's stalking me. On June 8, 2011, the town of Essex, Vermont, was shaken to its core when the lives of a selfless and loving couple, Bill and Lorraine Courier, took a dark and mysterious turn. Bill, a veterinary technician at the University of Vermont, and Lorraine, working in the financial services department at what is now known as the University of Vermont Medical Center, were the kind of neighbors who warmed your heart. They had no children of their own, but their open hearts invited the neighborhood kids over to swim, and they'd readily shovel sidewalks and mow lawns for those in need. Their quaint neighborhood, nestled in the town of Essex, with fewer than 20,000 residents, was the picture of small-town charm against the backdrop of Vermont's rich history and natural beauty. With 107 individual historic sites, Essex had come a long way since its incorporation as a town in 1810, evolving from a hub of sawmills and gristmills powered by the Winooski River to a thriving, vibrant community in northern Vermont. But little did anyone know that this picturesque setting would soon become the center of a grim and baffling true crime story. In the wake of their disappearance, Bill and Lorraine would become inextricably linked to the alleged actions of a serial killer, Israel Keys, who less than a year after his capture, in connection to the kidnapping and murder of Samantha Koenig in Anchorage, Alaska, would take his own life in a prison cell. The story that emerged, though shrouded in uncorroborated details, was a gruesome legend, with only evidence of theft, a struggle, and no recovered bodies. But Bill and Lorraine were not just victims in a chilling narrative. They were beautiful souls who left an indelible mark on their community, a testament to the goodness in humanity. Join us as we delve into the mystery that surrounds the disappearance of Bill and Lorraine Courier, exploring the depths of their lives, the darkness that engulfed them, and the enduring legacy of two individuals who made the world a better place. 
In the quiet town of Proctor, Vermont, on October 18, 1936, Bill Currier wasn't even a thought, as his father, Andrew Botwell Currier Jr., affectionately known as Sonny, was born to his parents, Andrew Botwell Currier Sr. and Leona Rolinda Cameron. Little did they know that Sonny would be the cornerstone of a family marked by both growth and change. Across the years and just a few towns away, in 1939, Bill's mother, a girl named Marilyn Ann MacArthur, entered the world to her parents, Stuart Stubb Alexander MacArthur and Dorothy Elaine MacArthur Hazelton. Fast forward to 1956, when Marilyn, Bill's mother at the tender age of 16, found herself expecting her first child. In an era where expectations ran high, Marilyn boldly walked down the aisle of the Essex Center Methodist Church, marrying Bill's father, Sonny, on May 22nd of 1956. Just four months later, they embraced the arrival of their first child, Cynthia. They wasted no time in growing their family as a year later, Michelle was born in 1957, followed by Diane in 1959, and then the birth of their only son, William Scott Courier, who they called Bill, was born in 1961. A young family of six had taken shape. However, marriage wasn't enough to tame Sonny's spirit, and when Bill was around three years old, Sonny fathered a fifth child, Lori, another woman named Susan Marie Harbinger, in Burlington, Vermont. This was more than Marilyn could bear, and before Lori's first birthday, Sonny and Marilyn separated, officially divorcing on October 2nd of 1964. He would later marry Suzanne. As Bill entered his teenage years, he found himself surrounded by sisters and lived predominantly with his father, Sonny, and his stepmother. This unique upbringing allowed Bill to mature faster than most boys and instilled into him the virtues of a gentleman, as he was raised to respect women. He was a true gentleman, renowned for his kind-hearted nature. Bill graduated from high school in 1979, but he stuck around Vermont undecided of his next steps in life. In May of 1983, Sonny and Susan divorced. And this forced Bill to make a life-changing decision as he left Vermont and his sisters behind enlisting in the United States Army. Bill was ready to embark on a path he believed in. For the next four years, Bill served his country and he found himself stationed in the enchanting paradise of Hawaii, a dream destination for many soldiers. That same year, on February 13th of 1983, Bill faced the tremendous loss of his maternal grandfather at the age of 73. And then, two years later, his stepmother, Suzanne, passed away after a long battle with lung cancer, succumbing to the respiratory arrest at the young tender age of 43 on June 23rd of 1985. As Bill's service came to an end, he found himself ready to come home. It sounds like... Bill's mom's parents kind of forced their daughter into a marriage. Well, first of all, anytime that you marry because you have a child, that's a problem. <laughs> I agree. But this is just going to be my guess is that that's probably what occurred. And I think it's highly likely given the fact that, of course, they end up splitting up because generally under those types of conditions, that type of relationship generally doesn't last or it's, it ends up being a miserable relationship yeah but back in those days you're talking about the 1960s you're talking about a time when people just assumed if you got her pregnant you was going get you was going to get married right and there's actually a news article that talks about announcing their engagement she was still in school so it even talks about her being still being in high school it talks about him having just graduating high school and working at a like a almost like a fast food type joint so it wasn't like Either one of them had a good job or like either one of them were in a good position. Obviously, she was young. She might have been almost 17 at the point in time where she was pregnant. And my guess is that they got married probably right after she graduated. His dad was the pastor for the church where they were married. And he actually officiated the marriage. His dad did. By shotgun proxy. That's what happens. They were making him hold up his end of the deal, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But that relationship doesn't last very long either because they end up getting a divorce as well, don't they? They do. They end up getting a divorce as well. And they had three kids together. So the younger three kids are both of theirs. And then he got married again and he didn't have any kids in that other marriage. They were all her kids. 
but he was the only boy in all those wow. girls. So it's, I think it's kind of interesting because I'm pretty sure it was just probably natural that he was a gentleman because he was used to being around a bunch of girls. Most of his exposure was probably to his sisters. Yeah. So aside from him being in the military, most of what anybody has talked about with him is just what a big heart he had yeah. and what a giving person he was, how if you weren't able to do something. So like one of the neighbors talked about how when she was unable to clear her driveway or mow the lawn that he would come and do that. Everybody just really talked about just what a kind hearted, selfless person he was. What did you know about his military service? Not much other than that. He was stationed in, in Hawaii, which he got lucky. I've been stationed in Hawaii. I wouldn't call it lucky. Hawaii is a, is a tough place to be stationed. A lot of people that get stationed there after being there for a little while, they get what they call rock fever, which is the inability to move around because you're stuck on this small little tiny island. And back in those days, they didn't even have the highway. Now they have a highway that goes around the whole island. That so sucks. you can, yeah. So back then it was just like dirt roads and like single lane highways. And so it, it wasn't, what it is now but i'm sure it was still a great place to be so here i you thought know. he got to get away he got away from vermont this was like his well compared to vermont <laughs> it was probably amazing for him because in vermont there was no oceans <laughs> yeah. so at least he was near the ocean and and i'm pretty sure he enjoyed his time there but um but yeah i think sometimes people think like he was just on the beach every day and it probably wasn't his, his deal <laughs> if he was stationed in hawaii then he was probably in an infantry unit I did ask some of his family if they knew what his MOS was and they didn't. And yeah. I didn't have enough time to get his military records. So Gotcha. And then we talk a little bit about the loss of his grandfather and also the loss of his stepmother as well. What was the impact on Bill with those losses? Well, they're so close together and I'm pretty sure with that being his first time away from home and he was young, he was in his 20s. He was probably missing home and then having these things occur while he's away. It probably was a lot for him. He hadn't been in the military very long at that point. It was probably a lot. And then as far as Suzanne goes, he spent a lot of time with her and she yeah. treated him like he was, you know, her own. And right. he had siblings, his stepmom. And so I think that was probably rough on him. That was yeah. probably more of a constant in his life, just because of the, his age at that point in time. Right. So. Makes sense. In the serene town of Norton, Vermont, a town known for its logging industry, a chapter of history was unfolding as Lorraine Simone Arnold was born on Independence Day, July 4th, 1955. Her parents, Paul Lamore Arnold and Clara Mary Broussard, at 27 years old, both held their own unique stories. Paul Lorraine's father was an Aquarius, born on February 7, 1928, in Stanhope, Quebec, Canada. He was the son of Richard and Roma Arnold. In contrast, Clara, Lorraine's mother, was a Capricorn, born on December 28, 1927, in Norton, Vermont, to Amity M. Brousseau and Marie Marguerite, or Margaret, Lely Klein. Lorraine's parents' love story blossomed when they married at the young age of 20 on June 5th of 1948, at the height of the Cold War between the U.S. and Russia. However, the fear of nuclear war didn't dampen Paul or Margaret's determination to grow their family, and it didn't take long for the arrival of their first child, Pauline, in 1951, after just three years of marriage. As the years rolled on, they embraced the birth of their first son, Ronald, in 1953, followed by two more daughters, Diane and young Sally, forming a close-knit family of seven that included Lorraine. Lorraine was a woman whose essence was described by those who knew her as a warm, loving soul with a heart of pure gold. She embodied a unique blend of qualities, combining a penchant for all things girly with a strong work ethic never shying away from getting her hands dirty when needed. Her roots were firmly planted in the Winooski, Vermont area, a place that would witness the unfolding of her life story. 
Lorraine's journey began with her role as a high school cheerleader. Reflecting her vibrant and spirited personality, she cheered in the Big Division II championship between Winooski High School and Hartford High School as a junior in 1972. Lorraine was also known for her unwavering determination and drive, setting clear goals for herself from a young age. In 1973, at the age of 18, she proudly walked the stage as a graduate of Winooski High School, marking the beginning of a promising future. Lorraine had a generous spirit, always ready to offer a helping hand, and her deep connection to her family was a defining aspect of her life. So there's a a little bit of a contrast, I feel like, between Bill and Lorraine's family. And that's that Bill kind of had that the parents splitting up several times, you know, divorce and a blended family. Right. And she kind of had like that old school, like your parents are together forever. And so she kind of got that all American home is a good way to put it. She seemed to be very close with her family and friends, just a very positive spirit to those that were around her and people really described her as just being she would be like that person that you couldn't be upset with because she's just so nice to everybody that was Lorraine the neighbors in their neighborhood talked about how they would invite the kids over to swim at their pool and everybody just enjoyed being around them like enjoyed having presence of both of them you know Bill and Lorraine around them She was a hard worker and the people who worked with her talked about, and actually both of them, that they weren't the kind of people to like unnecessarily call in or not show up to work or like take a lot of days off. Like they just were very committed to when they said that they were going to do something or when they were committed to something like they saw it through. And she was a pretty girl too. I see her picture from when she was in high school. That picture of her in her cheerleading outfit where she's by herself When I look at that picture and then I look at the picture of her and Bill together to me, I see like the same face. In the heart of Vermont, a unique story unfolded as William Bill Scott Courier, a dedicated U.S. Army soldier at 24 years old, and Lorraine Simone Arnold, a seasoned professional, six years his senior at 30, found themselves deeply enamored with one another. Their connection was marked by selflessness and unwavering love. Their love affair would culminate in a beautiful marriage ceremony in Grand Isle, Vermont, on July 20th of 1985. Bill devoted his days to caring for animals as an animal care technician at the University of Vermont, while Lorraine took on a crucial role at Fletcher Allen Healthcare, now known as the University of Vermont Medical Center, working as a finance specialist in the finance department. Together, they created a homebody haven at 8 Colbert Street, Essex, Vermont, where they could often be found working on household projects, basking in the serenity of their backyard, or enjoying the warm embrace of the sun in their pool. Their compassionate nature extended beyond their home, as they were frequently spotted assisting neighbors and actively participating in acts of kindness within their community. As the years passed and the aging process brought its inevitable challenges, Bill and Lorraine faced their respective health issues with remarkable resilience. Bill was 5'11 and weighed somewhere between 200 to 240 pounds, and though he grappled with the receding hairline, he maintained his dark brown hair with his most striking features being his piercing hazel eyes. Bill, however, struggled with type 2 diabetes, a chronic condition that demanded daily insulin injections. Additionally, a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis or Bechterev's disease, left Bill's vertebrae fused together, limiting the movement of his head and his neck. Lorraine, who was five years Bill Sr., stood at 5'4", and weighed somewhere between 150 to 170 pounds, faced her own challenges. She had straight brown hair that flowed past her shoulders and kind brown eyes. Her left leg was shorter than her right following an ankle surgery that caused her to endure an altered and noticeable gait pattern. Her finance work had impacted her vision over time and she required glasses or contacts to drive safely. Her medical journey was marked by cardiomyopathy, a condition that necessitated daily medication to support her heart's function. Despite these hurdles, Bill and Lorraine forged an unbreakable bond adhering to a consistent routine of hard work and unwavering commitment to one another. 
They found profound contentment in the life they had built and chose to fill it with joy of nieces and nephews. They had decided early in their relationship that children of their own was not a necessity and they shared their home with their one and only pet, a bird. Their love was a testament to resilience and their story was far from ordinary, offering a glimpse into a remarkable partnership that defied the odds. They start dating. I guess they, I don't know how long they dated for, but they eventually get married and they decide not to have any children. Is there a reason why? Something tells me that maybe she couldn't have kids or maybe they didn't want kids. You got to think about the fact that for one, they had a decent amount of siblings, both of them. And yeah. they might've thought like, eh, I don't want to have a bunch of kids. I'd rather work and hang out and have a simple life. Like that could have just been a decision for them to. They were together for a pretty long time. Yeah, they were. They really cared about each other, extremely happy with each other, and living an extremely happy life. Yeah. And actually, this picture that's posted um, most widely on the different news articles and blogs and all of that stuff of them is one of the last photos that they took kit together, and it was with, within a year of when they went missing. So they were still pretty close. How old was Bill and how old was Lorraine when they went missing? She was 55 and I think he was 49, maybe right before he turned 50. Wow, they're just pretty young. Yeah. And I had heard, you know, some things where Lorraine had been talking about how she thought somebody was watching her. She was starting to get kind of antsy. And she had actually just bought a firearm within months of when they went missing. She bought a a snub-nosed Ruger 38 handgun and that was the handgun that was missing in the home whenever they went into the home yeah it's unfortunate she didn't have that on her at the time of the break-in police said in july that the couriers were murdered now recently filed court documents say where and when news channel 5's lauren victory is live in the newsroom with the story tonight lauren Hi, Stephen George. Police and prosecutors confirmed again today that they have a suspect and have said that he or she is in custody in another state for unrelated crimes. Officials haven't revealed any other information about the murderer, but recently filed court documents that give us a glimpse of what he or she did. When investigators started digging at this site in April, they wouldn't say why. All they would say it was related to the courier. Recently filed court documents show police weren't just looking for evidence, they were looking for bodies. Lieutenant George Murdy of the Essex Police writes, the couriers were reported to have died by homicidal violence at an abandoned farmhouse. Investigators didn't find the couriers at the site, but Murdy's new affidavit says there were indications of human decomposition found in the farmhouse basement. Bill and Lorraine Courier's story is a sad one. With their abrupt disappearance, the mystery of their abduction left a hole in the community where they lived and were loved. These two selfless souls vanished from their Vermont home on the fateful evening of June 8, 2011. When they both failed to show up for work the next day, their co-workers knew something had to be wrong. It was uncharacteristic of them to miss work, and the concerns were elevated immediately. Bill's older sister, Diana, took the initiative and reported them missing to the Essex Police Department. As the police began their investigation, it became abundantly clear that something sinister had occurred when the phone lines were discovered severed, a broken window hinted at forced entry. The courier's vehicle was also missing. Lorraine's purse and wallet had vanished, but medication that she needed to survive was present. This was worrisome to the family and investigators. It was also determined early into the investigation that Lorraine's recently acquired handgun was also missing. It wasn't long before the courier's vehicle was located abandoned near a dumpster and witnesses provided a sketch of a mysterious man that had been seen driving the abandoned car. It was obviously not Bill. On June 15, 2011, the Essex Police Department declared Bill and Lorraine Courier victims of foul play, shifting the investigation from a missing persons case to a suspected homicide. Yet, despite an intensifying search and national spotlight on the case, their remains were never recovered. 
In early 2012, on the other side of the world, a manhunt was underway for the abduction of kidnapped and missing 18-year-old girl and barista, Samantha Koenig, in Anchorage, Alaska. There were no suspects, but the person who had abducted her was using her boyfriend's ATM card as he traveled from Alaska through Texas. The FBI had been tracking the use of the debit card and through video footage identified a suspect. It wasn't long before the police had Israel Keys in custody. Keys' arrest while in Texas for his sister's wedding should have brought more answers than questions, but as the FBI took over the investigation and Keys began disclosing pieces of the truth, the FBI learned of Keys' involvement with the disappearance of the couriers. Keyes would eventually disclose to law enforcement and the FBI that he had broken into the courier's residence, cutting the phone line, ransacking their car in the garage, and then kidnapped the couple and ultimately took both of their lives. He would provide additional details of other crimes he had committed, but that could not fully be corroborated with evidence. While some details he provided matched unpublished information about the home invasion, the full extent of this story remains shrouded in uncertainty, and as of the publishing of this podcast episode, neither Bill nor Lorraine's remains have been found. Authorities have searched where Keyes claims to have left the remains of the couriers in an abandoned home that had eventually been demolished. While there is a strong belief, a belief that has remained grounded in evidence, that Keyes committed a home invasion and theft at the Courier residence, the extent of his full narrative and the horrific details of what he told authorities he did to the Couriers still remains a subject of scrutiny as no real physical evidence has been brought forward. Israel Keyes would eventually make the decision to take his own life. As he struggled to maintain control over his incarceration, his negotiation with the FBI was not going as planned for him. And after a failed escape attempt, Keyes knew he would never get another chance. As a result, in the end, he used a razor to slit his left wrist and strangled himself with the bed sheet for good measure, leaving behind drawings he made using his blood and a poem, an ode to death. His untimely death would result in Keyes not being charged for the disappearance and deaths of Bill and Lorraine Courier, leaving their fate to haunt the unresolved shadows of true crime mystery. Israel Keyes was found dead in his Alaska prison cell over the weekend. The 34-year-old was being held on charges. He killed a teen barista while locked up. He told investigators he killed Vermont's Bill and Lorraine Courier in June of last year. He also admitted to a string of at least five other murders. Authorities say Key's death left them with questions and a number of unsolved murders. They announced today, however, the investigation into the Courier's murder is now closed. By all accounts, they were friendly, peaceful, good people who encountered a force of pure evil acting at random. It is the end in what local police called the ultimate investigation. A couple vanished from their Essex Junction home in June 2011, and officials suspected foul play. For close to 10 months, authorities had no clue who was involved in the disappearance of Bill and Lorraine Courier. That was until they got a call from officials in Alaska. A man named Israel Keyes was in custody, awaiting trial for the murder of an Alaskan teen. Authorities say as they continued to talk with Keyes, he confessed to seven other killings, including that of the Couriers. I would assume that once Bill and Lorraine didn't show up for work, the police were called right away or in short order. Yes. So they actually got called pretty quickly. And I think what really kind of escalated everything was the fact that once they got to the home and they noticed that the phone line had been cut and then they saw that the car was gone that the window was broken and that you could tell the window had been broken recently. So it wasn't like the window had been broken a while. And I guess he had actually pulled out, supposedly he pulled out some type of like AC unit or some type of vent from there in order to be able to bust the window. I don't know. That was new. So when the police got in the house and then saw like the bird, how the, they had like a blanket over the bird cage that was still there. The medication, her glasses, um, his wallet was actually there. Now her purse and her wallet was gone but just things that you would take if you were going to be gone for a little while remained in the home. And then something like her weapon was gone. 
I think they were already thinking like something bad's happened, but they didn't really have anything to support that fully yet. Like they really didn't have any, anything that took place in the house that they could really see. So then when they found the car, I think that kind of confirmed for them, especially because of where the car was found. So the car wasn't found like in front of a business or anything like that. Like it was found near a dumpster and the location of the vehicle, not very far from their house, not too far from their house, um, very close to a bus stop. They started processing the car and they're like, whatever happened wasn't of the courier's, you know, willful doing. The police actually moved really quick in their case as far as kind of escalating things and how they determined to move the case from because it went from a missing persons case to a suspected homicide case pretty early on, you know, within the first couple months. And they also so there's only 13 states in the U.S. who have legislation that requires that they put their missing people into the NamUs database, which is a nationwide database and and honestly worldwide for people to look at where you can see people who are missing where they're missing from and all those details vermont is not one of those 13 states but they actually moved very quickly to put both bill and lorraine's information in there so that people could see it so that they could get the national attention out some of that worked and if you go back and you look at the sketch of the guy who was seen driving the car and you compare it with Israel Key's look at the time, very, very close with yeah. the description. Well, I know what Israel Key says happened with the couriers in terms of what he did and what he says he did. And we cover that in a different podcast uh, where we talk about Israel Keys and his crimes. But the fact that he kidnapped Samantha Koenig in Alaska and then his journey through Texas you know, using the debit card eventually led to his capture. Why did he tell them about the couriers? What was the motivation there? I know that they were going through his laptop. So I know that Israel Keys was trying to maintain some type of upper hand in the whole situation. He knew he was in jail for forever, no matter what, no matter what he told or didn't tell. He knew he was done. When they stopped him with Samantha, they had pretty damning evidence in his car connecting him to her. Right. But then when they got his laptop, he knew that they were going to find other things. And so I think that because of the laptop, I think he was kind of moving towards like, I'm going to go ahead and give them what they're already going to kind of find out. Right. Plus I think he was also wanting to make them think that he really had something to, to negotiate because if he didn't, if, They've got him caught red handed with one person and it's pretty bad. They had a lot of evidence against him in the car, not the work of a meticulous individual, but they had him. And so the only way that he was going to have any leverage was for him to put something out there that allowed for him to have leverage. And so I think that that's where things came in with the couriers. Right. I don't know what it is. I just really have this serious doubt and I haven't seen a hundred percent of the evidence. So Could there be things out there that could maybe sway me in a different direction? Maybe. But of the interviews and of the actual evidence that I have seen, because we have seen a lot, I believe that a lot of what he said, especially in the Courier's case, is a lot of embellishing. And I think we can all agree that there's a lot of evidence out there that he was a thief and that he was a good well, a decent thief, I guess. I don't know that I would agree with a lot of the other things. So I think he was a con and I think he was a thief. As far as evidence in the courier's case, he told them where pieces of the firearm were or pieces of maybe the silencer that he used. They were able to recover that and they were able to recover Lorraine Courier's firearm. And so that's the evidence that they have. And then, of course, the fact that he was able to give them details that nobody else would have known as far as the break in at the courier's house. So do I believe that he killed them? I do because all of the evidence supports that, you know, he was the last person to see them alive. Right. You're not questioning whether he had anything to do with Samantha or with the couriers. You're just talking about 
all the other high volume number of bodies that are supposedly attributed to him as a serial killer. Cause there's more evidence to support that he was a super fan, honestly. Yeah. So, you know, all of the missing things and, and I don't want to make this podcast all about keys because we've already talked about him, but there's more evidence to support that he was a fan as opposed to that. He was this meticulous, elusive, greatest serial killer of all times. And according to the FBI's categorization of a serial killer at this point in time with the couriers, and maybe that was part of his deal, he barely made it to the cutoff of being a serial killer, which is three people. So, right. And he couldn't be charged for the couriers because not only in him committing suicide, but the fact that because the FBI was involved and they were trying to work this deal and thinking he had all this information, even though they had been talking to him for months, he had all this information that he was going to release. They were kind of getting Vermont to hold off in the hopes that keys would release more information. So I almost feel like he was using it as leverage, honestly, yeah. more than anything. It's true that bad things happen to good people, and this case is a great example of the tragedy that often befalls those who are least deserving of it. Of course, Israel Keyes has garnered the title of serial killer, although very little evidence supports his boastful claim of being more prolific than Ted Bundy or the Green River Killer. And only one victim, Samantha Connick, can be tied to him directly. Bill and Lorraine continue to be listed as missing persons. Should you possess any information about the disappearance of Bill and Lorraine Courier, we urge you to contact the Essex Police Department at 802-879-4923. Reference case number 11E as in Echo, as as in Sierra, 03888. Or reach out to the Vermont State Police. Anonymous tips can be submitted on their website as detailed in our show notes or by texting VTIPS to 274-637. Additional information about the Courier's case can be found on NamUs, the Vermont State Police, and the Charlie Project websites, all conveniently linked in our show notes and on the Body of Crime Facebook page. As we close the Israel Keys series, it's important to understand that true crime stories should avoid idolizing those of us who are often broken beyond salvation. Israel Keys was no folk hero. He was no Robin Hood. Serial killers should be studied for prevention. They should be studied for understanding. They should be studied to predict and prevent, and when necessary, to apprehend and stop them. Israel Keys preyed on the weakest of our society. He wasn't a lion among men. He was a rabid hyena, scouring the shadows of the world, looking for the weakest and the most feeble. What does it say of you to admire a man who robbed the poor, raped the young, and killed the old and the weak? Israel Keys told the FBI tall tales of robberies, tortures, murders, and rapes, all just unconfirmed stories that he used to barter and negotiate for control with the FBI while he was incarcerated. The only real thing about Israel Keys is that he lived a pathetic life and died a pathetic death. Good riddance. And that's a wrap on today's investigation, fellow detectives. If you found this episode both enlightening and captivating, then please subscribe to our podcast show and our Patreon. Leave a review and hit that like button. Share our podcast with others and engage with us on our website and social media platforms. You can find us on all major podcast platforms as well as our website at www.bodyofcrimepodcast.com where you can access all of our episodes and bonus content, including valuable resources. By expanding our community, we believe we can make a greater impact in our pursuit of truth and in shedding light on crucial cases. If there's a case that you'd like for us to cover or a personal story you'd like to share, please don't hesitate to contact us through our website. We always welcome your feedback and suggestions. Until next time, stay sharp, and thank you for tuning in to the Body of Crime Podcast. Podcast. Bye.